Um, I also want to congratulate the member from Canterbury on this, her first Westminster Hall debate, and from the way in which she's approached this, I'm sure it's not going to be the last. And after the government does publish its response to the UN um, inquiry, I'll be more than happy to come back to this chamber and debate it with her then. But just before I start making my responses to the individual points that were raised, like everyone else in this chamber, I want to ensure that every disabled person or person with a health condition in our country has the opportunity to play their full part in society. Now, that includes where they can, at work, and of course there are disabled people who can't work, and they must be supported. But I utterly refute the allegations that have been made today, that we are discriminating against disabled people, that we are systematically under undermining and violating their human rights, or worst of all, that we are targeting them when it comes to welfare support. I have so little time and I've been asked so many questions that I won't take an intervention. We are utterly committed to the Convention. You know, it was Britain that helped develop and shape this Convention. We are one of the first countries in the world to sign it and to ratify it in 2009. And we're one of the very, very few nations that have also ratified the Conventional's optional protocol, which allows for individual complaints to be raised and permits the UN Committee to investigate those particular violations or allegations of violations of the Convention. And that is what happened. And it's that we are the, this is the first time that it has happened. And we were very disappointed um, when the representatives of the UN came to the UK, they simply did not take on board that the evidence that the government gave them. They did not acknowledge the full range of support. And when we set out our response, and I will be setting that response out in full, we'll be very clearly making the case and rebutting the allegations that have been levelled against us. We firmly believe that a disability or health condition should not dictate the path a person is able to take in life, including in society or the workplace. And this is at the basis of everything that we're doing to try to make sure that disabled people are able to realise their potential, including at work. As I said, we're very engaged with the United Nations. We've had constructive meetings. We are constructively engaging with them. And of course, I will be meeting all in full the reporting requirements. Now, in line with the conventions, as members will know, disability is mainstreamed. It's mainstreamed across government. And I want to reassure everyone that we have very strong legislation in, uh, on our statute to protect disabled people. That's through the Public Sector Equality Duty in the Equality Act 2010 and in the Northern Ireland Act 1998. These are very strong protections, some of the strongest protections in the world. Now, I was asked by the member for Oldham East and Southerwell, you know, why we've not performed a cumulative impact assessment about welfare reform. Well, we do undertake a cumulative assessment of reforms each fiscal event. And this is because we want to be as transparent as possible regarding the cumulative distributional impacts of government policy, including welfare reforms, tax changes, direct and indirect, and public spending changes. And to present as full a picture as possible, HMT has a project, they project forward living costs and food survey, which includes all the information that members have mentioned today. And this information enables me to say today very clearly that the proportion of people in a family where someone is disabled um, in relative poverty has not risen since 2010. These allegations that we are driving people to the food banks and forcing people into destitution is simply an irresponsible <laughs> statement. And the proportion of people in a family where someone is disabled who are in, in absolute poverty is at a record low. And that's because we're spending over 50 billion a year on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions. Now that's up by 7 billion since 2010, and it's around 2.5% of GDP, over 6% of the government spending. Now as a share of our GDP, our public spending on disability and incapacity is the second highest in the G7. Only Germany spends more. 
And disability spending will be higher every year, right the way through the spending review, every year higher than 2010. There is no freeze on the benefits that um, people with disabilities have received, and they are not subject to the cap. So it is really important in these debates that we have the facts. Of course there's more we can do. Of course I want to close the disability unemployment gap. Of course there's always more we can be doing. But let's actually deal with the facts of the situation and stop this really quite irresponsible um, talk that we hear in the chamber today and we hear it in the main chamber. Because, you know, who's going to suffer? Who's going to suffer from what, we are, what we've been hearing from the opposition today? It is going to be disabled people and their families who are going to be frightened, frightened to come forward and get the benefits that are there for them, frightened to come forward and get the support that's available to them. Now, in the few remaining moments, I want to touch on some of the criticisms that we've heard about PIP and ESA. Now, PIP and ESA has been subject to...